So rules of engagement are as follows. Each of my panellists will be given no more than two minutes, um, or That's two minutes-ish, <laughs> if I can hold them to that, to give their opening remarks. And then really it's over to you guys. I'm sure that you have built up at least a few questions throughout today, because the alternative would be to suggest that all of you have used today's sessions to have all of your questions answered, and I don't believe that's true. So please do not hold back when it comes to trying to fill in some of the gaps that might reside within your knowledge. So what I'd like to do, though, is go in reverse order to how I invited them up, and I'm going to give the first word to Professor Huntington. Please. You can sit down if you like, or you can stand up. Sitting down might be more comfy for this um, one. So uh, first sign that you're dealing with a panel of uh, strong women. We're not going in the order that you want. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I feel totally redundant now. This is great. Yeah. Okay, over to you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brad. Uh, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, any time. Go ahead. <laughs> Two minutes, remember? <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, well, we're going to try to keep it light, and I think we're on that, uh, off to a good start on that one as we uh, clean up the day. Uh, I'm glad to see we still have quite a few uh, people in the room here. So, um, as Brad mentioned, my name is Jennifer Mulvaney. I'm with Adobe, responsible for government relations for Asia Pacific. Um, I'm very passionate about the area of education and creativity. I read a a survey um, as I was preparing for this today that said that about 82% of people um, in the world wish they had more creativity and creative problem solving as part of their education. Um, that resonated with me as someone who works for one of the most creative companies in the world, but also as someone who definitely falls into that 82%. I badly wish that I had more creativity and, and problem solving in, in my education as opposed to these sort of learn the math, regurgitate, and don't dare ask any questions about how it applies to the real world. Just keep, you know, ticking through your, your education. And um, by the time I got to my senior year and I was just begging my guidance counselors to do something different other than this path I was on, um, I really had to be a self-advocate in, in, ter in terms of taking um, courses that were off of my track. Um, and so glad that I did. And I, I, I think that that's very important. So some research that Adobe does, and we do lots of um, uh, research and polling around uh, learning and education and, of course, creativity in the classroom. Um, right on the back of a World Economic Forum study that came out uh, this year in Davos, which showed that, once again, complex problem solving is the number one skill that uh, the World Economic Forum predicted is needed for the future. But it's that creativity um, as a subset of that. I think they said in 2015 that was about number 10 on the list of skills of creativity. But for their next prediction for 2020, it's number three on the list. So it's, it's sort of ticking up in terms of the importance of creativity. And of course, I think that there's no um, coincidence there that it's, it's the AI sort of alongside of that that's going to say creativity is being more important than ever. Um, some research that we did that sort of got us thinking about how we could do some polling um, of educators and policymakers and students around creativity. And across the board, it was in the high 90s, 96%, 97% of teachers and students and policymakers would love to see more creativity in the classroom. Um, again, it could be because they have that hat, whether it's a student or a teacher or a policymaker, but also everyone's been a student, right? They, they have the personal experience of what they went through in school. Um, so the question is, well, why can't we get these things? If they're so, if it's 96%, 98%, what's holding us back? Um, and it really is, comes down to the three Ts. There's not enough time in the day to, to teach new things. Um, there's not enough training so that you have this great idea. How do you get the, the experts in the classroom to teach the kids new software? Um, and there's just not enough of the actual tools, you know, the actual software in the classrooms to get loaded on computers and teach kids creativity, either digitally or, or otherwise. Um, so that is definitely something that uh, it does take a lot of effort and resources to sort of turn that around. Um, I would say, too, that for uh, Adobe, we really try to focus on creating some digital um, online platforms where teachers can have exchanges of best practices. Uh, we have it's called the Adobe Education Exchange, and that's worldwide. We have about 10,000 uh, Australian educators on that exchange where they can go online and, and just sort of share how they're teaching creativity in the classroom, digitally or not digitally, how they're using whether it's Adobe Photoshop or our Illustrator. Um, my son last week had a homework assignment where he had to draw, and I, he clearly wasn't paying attention to the classroom. He had to, he had to draw an example of surrealism. And he goes, 7.30 at night, and he's like, Mom, how do I draw surrealism? I think, I, 
first of all, why are you asking me this at 7.30 at night when I'm trying to get dinner on the table? Um, and so he was just hit, so we looked up some examples and he was trying to, he was trying to take what he saw on the computer um, of you know, the, the dripping watch that we all know is sort of the, the, the surrealism and he was trying to draw it on paper and got very, very frustrated because now it's 7.50 at night and he's trying to draw surrealism on a piece of paper. And so I said, hey, why don't you just go on and just see if you can do this digitally? And he said, well, what do you mean? So of course, being the good Adobe employee, I opened up some Adobe software, which I can, I have to admit, can not very well use myself. I probably haven't taken the amount of time to do all the internal training that I should. Um, but he just opened up Illustrator and just sort of grabbed his cursor and was making these sort of, of long shapes. And all of a sudden, it became very intuitive to him on, on what he could do to add color and add things. And it probably took a little bit more time because he had to sort of gear up for about 15 minutes to learn what it meant. But I think it was just that, that excitement of just doing something different than probably what every other kid in the class was doing um, that sort of really made him light up. So um, that's an example, I think, that we just need to sort of aspire for is thinking outside the box. And, I think when it comes to policy, we can talk about this maybe as we get a little bit um, into the panel, but just in terms of what the calls to action can be, I think it's having those more exchanges between teachers and policymakers and students about what's needed, some public-private partnerships, I'm sure that's come up quite a bit today, but that's something we would definitely advocate for. Right. Was that two minutes, or should I ask, uh, was that two minutes, am I okay? <laughs> <laughs> Who'd like to go next? <laughs> I'm in charge. I'm yes. going next. Okay. Um, uh, so, so I guess I'll, I'll just pick up on, on uh, three points and then hopefully we'll um, throw to the room for some discussion. Uh, I have no idea what I want to be when I grow up and I never have. Uh, and uh, one of the things that became clear to me when I was young was that I was um, very good at science and very good at maths. Um, and I made the mistake of thinking that I needed to have a career in science. Uh, what I should have learnt was that one of the, um, while I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, I do know what I want to do, and what I want to do is make a difference. So, um, with that in mind, uh, I was, am, and always will be an engineer, because what engineers do is they take mastery of science and maths and use it to creatively solve human problems. So, that has, that that has um, been an important life journey uh, and le life lessons for, lesson for me. And it's one of the reasons that sits behind this story that I was telling uh, in the previous session that I think the metaphor of a leaky pipeline for STEM skills is the wrong metaphor. Uh, because uh, people lose interest in science and maths because mm. it's hard and they don't feel confident mm, in it. Mm, yeah. But actually, these are skills that you need these days in order to solve human problems. So this is why I think the education system needs to run with a different metaphor, which is instead of the leaky pipeline, we need to think of um, something much more like the London, a map of the London Underground, where you can start anywhere and end anywhere, and there are lots of different railway tracks, and our job as educators is to create the kind of railway stations that allow people to switch between those lines. Um, and I think we should be uh, having a, a talk about what that looks like and rolling our sleeves up and giving it a go. And the reason I would suggest that we need to think about that is because if all we ever do is have a leaky pipeline, we are only ever going to be where we are now, which is that we have half as many engineers as we need. We have a workforce shortage of uh, known to be at least 80,000 people over the next five years. We have a largely male and pale uh, workforce at the moment. Um, and that's not my phrase, I, I got it from a, from a report somewhere else, but it's excellent, I like it. Um, and we have people who come from a very particular socioeconomic demographic and a particular urban lifestyle, mostly. Um, and what's more, when people, when unusual, unusual, people come to our qualifications, they get into the workforce and they find it an extremely adverse environment. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, the average number of uh, female engineers in Australia is 15%. There are a quarter of a million engineers in Australia and fewer than a thousand of them are women over 50. Just think about that for a second. The, uh, the chances of a young woman dropping out of an engineering job within one year of graduating is twice that of a young man. So this is not about going away and having babies. This is about it's not a nice place to be. So until we can fix all of those sorts of things, until we can actually create a diverse and inclusive environment where we actually value and respect the fact that people take a different journey to get where they are, we are in uh, deep trouble and this country will not be able to participate in the 21st century as we go. And very nicely segueing over here, I would point out that whenever I sit in a room with cybersecurity professionals, if you ask them, where did they come from? Fewer than 10% of them came through a computer science qualification. 
So as a shining example of what can be done and what you can do if you allow people to come back, actually, cybersecurity is a really interesting place to start. Mm. I'll be quiet now. It's a good segue to Gay. Yeah, thanks very much for having me here today, and, uh, and it's, it's wonderful to be on the first panel I have ever been on, which is 100% women. So, yeah, I think we should all give ourselves a round of applause Yay. for that. <laughs> this is absolutely going to light up on Twitter. <laughs> so I hope everyone's got lots of pictures. Uh, look, I, uh, I'm looking, I, I want to look at this, I'll discuss this um, from a cyber security perspective because that's the sort of prism from which I live now, the world in which I live. And as many of you know, we've got a skill shortage, well, the, the, the word was that we had a skill shortage of 11,000 uh, people in cyber security now. Uh, but I was at a conference just uh, earlier this week where I heard that we've got a skill shortage of 19,000 people here in Australia. Uh, that's a lot of cyber security expertise that we currently don't have in this country. So I know the discussion today has focused on the challenges of this disruptive, and I, I, I'm not a fan of that term, but the, the new environment that we're going into, this disrupted environment, but uh, there are significant opportunities in the cybersecurity sphere. Now, and they're not uh, just for people from a STEM background. I'm firmly of the belief that uh, there has been too much focus on just STEM being the pathway to cyber security, uh, which is why we only have, we've got between, depending on the study, about nine to 11% of women are in cyber security. And we've heard from Eleanor about engineering. And when I first met Eleanor, I've got to share this story. It was when she just um, got the professorship at the ANU. And we were talking about our concern, our shared concern about the fact that there were so few women in STEM. Both my sisters are scientists, by the way, and I'm the one who dudded out uh, when it came to that, uh, yeah, physics. That was the thing that turned yeah, me in, year right. for, and, um, yeah, in form five. But I, much as I loved, uh, much and I, and I was in love with my physics teacher, John Lawton, but anyway. <laughs> um, I, you out yeah, there? <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> The, uh, Eleanor was telling me this great story about, she was really concerned about the lack of computer graduates who were women. And so she actually went down to the computer lab at the ANU to see, you know, to get a sense about the environment uh, in which uh, students were studying. <laughs> well, you could tell the story no, if you want, you but do it, better. it was just, she went into this room, there were no windows in the room. And uh, there were all these young blokes uh, of, um, uh, sitting around in hoodies uh, and black jeans and runners, uh, there was uh, piles and piles and piles of uh, pizza boxes lying around. And as you can imagine, the uh, the environment in the um, the room was pretty <laughs> ripe. Um, personal hygiene wasn't top on the agenda for these blokes. And so Eleanor uh, quite rightly thought, well, why would a young woman actually want to study in a computer lab like this that's, you know, incredibly pongy, and there ain't no windows, and highly attractive under fluorescent lights, or highly unattractive, rather, under fluorescent lights, which, is, which was, as she said, no wonder. I mean, that was not the only reason. But the environment, which is so important to encourage people to educate and thrive, um, was stifling uh, women, well, one of the reasons why women weren't getting involved. So I think that that's, um, that was, uh, I love that, I love telling that story. Anyway. I know you do. <laughs> Sorry for that's telling okay. it too often. Uh, but yeah, I think that there's too much focus on STEM uh, being the, the pathway to cyber security. We need people, uh, of those 19,000, we need people from a broad range of backgrounds. Uh, and what is lacking is a skills map of what industry actually needs. Uh, industry tells me all the time that we don't have fit for purpose graduates, uh, that we don't have fit for purpose uh, vocational uh, educational graduates uh, who are work ready uh, when they come into the, um, the workplace. Uh, well, let's speak to industry and get them to actually say, what do you actually need? Do you, how many, how many engineers do you need? How many technicians do you need? How many ethics? do you need? How many human behaviourists do you need? Uh, because we need a broad range of skills and we do need to think laterally on those skills and uh, we need to go to industry to actually ask them what they need. And finally, I do think that we need a, a multidisciplinary approach to cyber security uh, and I do believe that we need more hairdressers in there. 
And I say we need more hairdressers in there because hairdressers are the great students of human behaviour. Anyone knows that, well, the stories that you tell your hairdresser, you don't tend to tell anyone else. And, uh, and they are vaults, as we know. The story does not go any further. They are great secret agents in many, way too, many ways too. But they are great cyber security. Uh, in my view, they would be great cyber security uh, experts, analysts, because they are great students of human behaviour. They are vaults when it comes to the intelligence that they hold and uh, and they do anticipate and read human behaviour really well. You know that when you go to a, your hairdresser, you sit down, they know, he or she knows whether you've had a good day or a bad day and then you divulge everything to them, everything uh, that's gone on for the whole week. So I think that uh, we need to be lateral about the way that we uh, approach our cyber security recruitment. We need to think creatively as has been mentioned, about where we get our, uh, our skills and experts from. And, uh, and we certainly need to look at um, hairdressers as an option. Just finally, uh, hairdressers are an incredibly powerful communication tool as well. Uh, in the US, there's this great study of this uh, group of hairdressers uh, that uh, are in a community uh, where the breast cancer, the, the number of women uh, getting tested for breast cancer was particularly low. And the... Breast Cancer Council of the US, uh, or New York, I think it was in, mobilised the hairdressers to actually say to their clients, you've got to go and get a breast test, a, breast, uh, a mammogram every sort of over 50, every two years. You need to go and do this. You need to take this seriously. And the rate of um, mammogram testing went up dramatically as a result of this campaign using hairdressers as the communication tool to, um, to women. So... That is the power of a hairdresser. Uh, and I do think that we should think laterally as far as possible, creatively, and uh, because there's so much expertise that we can draw on and we do have a significant uh, skill shortage and I don't think it should just be confined to STEM. Thank you. Some interesting food for thought there. Look, I've got a few questions in mind, but this isn't my session, it's yours. So what I would like to do now is find... Where are our roving mics? One over there. All right, just yes, thank you. <coughs> Anyone have a question for our panel, please? Okay, you must have something. Right, thank you. This chap over here, he's been working hard all day. This is like question number three. <laughs> Love this guy. If, do we have a bottle of wine we can give him or something? But look, thank you. Um, just one thing, and we've got another one way over there. That's good. Keep them active. Keep them moving. It's good. They'll get their steppers up. One thing I will just say before, though, 150 tweets, people not good enough. All right, social media people in the room, let's get active. Let's push word out there. We've got some fantastic panellists. We've had some fantastic discussions. Let's drive word out through the new form of social media. We don't have any hairdressers here that I'm aware of, but we do have the power in our smartphones to reach the world, so please don't hold back. Sir, go ahead. Yeah, Darren Harvey, CTO Group. Um, just so we've talked about uh, getting people attracted to study STEM. What about... Uh, retrofitting existing workforces with, with more gender diversity. Uh, in particular, we're in technology consulting in my industry. Um, we, prob we might not have the right environment, we're not sure. Um, how do we learn what we need to do? Because we haven't got the women, all, uh, enough women there to... Sorry, Audrey. Enough women <laughs> to create the, the, the awareness of what we need to do to attract more women to that, to our industry, and particularly our company. Eleanor, you're more than welcome. Uh, okay, so, um, so there, there was a very interesting study done, I think it was at Harvard, uh, certainly by an economics department somewhere in North America anyway, that looked at um, what were the factors that were influencing career choices uh, in young women in particular. And the principal factor, the only one that they could find that had any statistical um, relevance whatsoever, was um, their, the perception of uh, how in gender inclusive their, um, their employer, the, the, the employment market was going to be after graduation. So it was not about how their perceptions of how hard the training, the education was going to be. It was not about their perceptions about how skilled they personally would be, or indeed what qualifications they had coming in. It was whether or not it was going to be a good place to work at the end, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, if, and so that, that's one side of things in terms of how do we actually attract more people into these, these careers. We need to do 
much better at, I mean, we've, we've done wonderfully well over the last couple of years at starting to raise the level of discourse and the frequency of discourse around issues to do with, with gender and inclusion generally. But unfortunately, some of the tone is now, it's a crap place to be, it's a horrible place to work, there's only 10% women, it's bad, um, which helps when you're trying to convince the Neanderthals in your, in your workforce that actually you need to do something, but it really doesn't help in terms of attracting. So one of the things that they're doing in the UK now is a lot of the very large firms are now starting to band together to try to send a much more clear and specific message about the fact that they are working hard at making it a more uh, inclusive place to work. And that um, they are doing that because they believe that that is going to, to help with things. In terms of taking people who have already left the STEM pipeline um, and want to come back and uh, bring different skills with them, uh, then we need, we, frankly, we need some more of these railway stations in the, in the map of the London Underground. And what I mean by that is qualifications of some kind. They don't have to be fully formed degrees, although that there will need to be some of those, where you take, where you explicitly take people from one kind of background and value that and then add that to other skills so that they can go off and do something new and different. Um, we're trialling that at the ANU. We've got two master's degrees going at the moment, one in data analytics and one in cybersecurity, where we are explicitly taking people from um, a range of different backgrounds, only one of which is either computer science or engineering, and connecting them with uh, social science skills as well as law, business, whatever it needs to be, uh, so that they can um, communicate across a range of different disciplines to actually get stuff done. And yeah, I'll be completely honest, what I'm trying to do is take people who did an undergraduate law degree and lure them over to the dark side, but that's what we've got to do. Good. Any further comments on that one? Otherwise, we'll move on. I think we had another question on this side first. No? Yes? Whoever gets the mic first, go for it. Go ahead. If we can just get one ready for the... OK, that's ready to go. Go ahead, please. Hello. Kylie Boland, Department of Human Services. Your story about the pizza boxes in the computer lab just touched something for me. So I graduated 25 years ago, computer science, back in Hobart, Tasmania. I was one of two girls in my year and no female toilets in the computer science Oh, yeah. yeah. But what I'm worried about is that we haven't changed. Yeah. That's 25 years ago. What have we done? What are we doing? Me again? Maybe. Or Gay, were you wanting to jump in on that one? No? How about to your narrative, first of all? Yeah, well, <laughs> they're very good questions. And I ask the same thing when I look at those cyber security questions. It is... The, it is still very much the same. It's, uh, I remember I was um, typing up my boyfriend's honours thesis in ANU in the, in the computer lab in the early 80s and it was the day when you had to, even for a bracket, you had to put a code in uh, and you had to put a code in for a full stop. It was all pretty basic and I'd go in there late hours of the night and, uh, and do the... Um, type up the thesis and yeah I was the only one in there uh, that was a, a female but uh, it is you, you see it at conferences you see it on panels it, it I, I agree it hasn't changed uh, there is a, still a lot of there's a lot of focus on stem there's a lot of trying to get women into stem there's a number of study there's endless studies that have been done on on why women aren't continuing through that path uh, and uh, we've just got to keep at it We've just got to keep at it in terms of getting the, girl, uh, the girls engaged at the primary school level, uh, continuing at the secondary school level, uh, either opportunities at vocational level um, as well as tertiary level, and once they get into the workforce, a flexible workforce, opportunities for them there. Um, as I mentioned to you, my, both my sisters are, uh, one's a scientist and one's a neurologist, and the neurologist has, uh, the, 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 the discrimination that she has experienced, particularly post baby, uh, particularly the sort of the publish or perish culture, uh, the fact that the, and that was all the whole publish or perish culture is, is geared around a full time workload. And so you can't do that if you're working part-time. You can't publish as much as you can uh, if you're working full-time. And so we do need at every point to eliminate those barriers for girls and women uh, to achieve. And so we just need to stay on it. We need to keep our attention focused on it. And I know that people get bored with banging on about panels being 100% or 60% women. But, but the thing is that most of us 
are used to being on panels where we're the only woman. And, uh, and so, yeah, we're going to celebrate that. I'm sorry, and we're going to celebrate that on Twitter. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to be loud and proud about that, and that's what we need to do. We need to celebrate our achievements, but we also need to stay on it and stay focused on it. Here, here. At the back, please. Hi, Murray Hutley Jackson from the Department of Industry. I worked in ICT for about 20 years, and I just wanted to raise something that's a bit sensitive, but nonetheless, I'm launching anyway. Um, the sexual harassment in the industry was horrific back then and there's no reason for me to think that it's any different now. And with the Me Too campaign, I think that this is an opportunity to start doing something about that. And one of the things that really struck me in the industry was that the reputational damage of being involved in something like that for an organisation was just too high and the only motivation they had was to cover it up. And it seems to me if we continue with the naming and shaming culture, then that problem won't go away and neither will the sexual harassment. So I'd just like to suggest that we try to find other ways of, of addressing the issue without shaming the organisation that's brave enough to address it and come to a resolution. So I'm wondering if you've got any ideas about how we could do that. Um, yeah, sorry, that question did come a little bit out of the field for me. I do, obviously, being a woman and watching the Me Too, and I actually did have an interview, um, an informal interview with a, a friend of mine who's doing a documentary on the Me Too, um, the, the Me Too movement. She's doing it from here um, for, for in Australia. Um, and being an American, obviously, it's something I, I watch very closely. And I do have a, a lot of respect for the women that are, that are standing up. It, it's very, very brave. Um, and I do think that it, uh, it, it's getting the attention it deserves. Um, I think we will move in the right direction. I think the louder the voices, you tend to have things move in the right direction, whether it's gay marriage, whether it's the Me Too movement. Um, I do have hope that the, the, uh, the background checks for guns in America, because of the loud voices and the kids speaking up, will also move in that right direction. So um, I, I great on them for people really putting aside their day jobs um, to pay attention to something like this that really um, should not be buried and, and be um, highlighted. All right, no further response on that. We'll move on. We had, yes, please go ahead. Yep, you're all right, just. Hello? Yep. Um, Elizabeth Vega, um, Deputy Chair of the AWIA. Um, I have a question as regards, uh, Eleanor, we, we were discussing before about influencing girls at a very young age before they actually decide on their academic journey. Mm. Um, I'm aware of a lot of code clubs in schools that are supported by, um, by employers. For example, we do that. Some of our technical staff actually go into the local schools and support young people uh, who, who do hackathons and, uh, and actually have got regular coding clubs after school. Um, we find a lot of the girls actually get attracted to that because we invite them to bring a real world problem, whether it's actually, uh, and this is going to feel frivolous, but it's actually quite relevant to them. I want to remember what outfit I wore to different things, and they develop apps, uh, apps around it. Or um, it's their real-world problems, mm. and then we show them how technology can be relevant to solving those problems, and that gets Indeed. them when they're quite young, Indeed. Uh, and it feels important to their lives. And then, of course, they're more motivated to build up their competence and solve other bigger real-world problems as they hopefully get older. Um, is anything like that happening at the moment in Australia? Uh, the, the short answer is uh, yes, um, not enough. Uh, so, so there's research that says that um, young kids lose confidence and start to lose competence um, in these sorts of skills. There are a few key windows. One is the age window between age five and eight. There's another one around about age 12 and another one around about age 15 or so. Uh, and disproportionately young girls le leak out of the pipeline at that moment, at, at those points, but uh, lots of people do. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that is going on there is that um, in a, there's, been a, there's been research that, that shows all across the OECD, if you have an education system that is framed, uh, that's a comprehensive education system that's framed around letting kids choose what they feel confident in, um, they will tend to make the sorts of selections that you see in Australia and in the UK and in North America. Um, and 
that means that it's all about building confidence in skills. Uh, and if you, um, if you don't have teachers who feel confident, if you don't have parents who feel confident, if you don't have other key influences of kids who feel confident and therefore make them feel confident, that's actually what happens. So the key, the, the principal influences we need to get to are the dads of five-year-old girls. Just one other thing, I just want to add to this while the microphone comes. This is something that I don't have statistics on, but just for me personally, I just recall when I started to be that leaky, le leaking out of the system, and I felt it very strongly. It wasn't, mm. I, didn't, I didn't even make it to physics, because it, for me it was, I loved biology because yeah. I could really see the real life application of what I was learning in a biology class when you talked about you know, animals and, and people. It was when things became more abstract and I felt like I was learning equations just for the sake of learning equations with no application to the real world. And I recall even asking questions, you know, what could this mean for what I want to yeah. be when I grow up? And just crickets. Like, yep. really couldn't get a good answer about how math could be applied to something that's not a traditional math career. Yep. And those discussions weren't happening. And that, that discussion can happen at such a young age. Yep. Um, and, and putting that into the schools where you start to have teachers, educators talk about careers at the ages of six, seven, eight, yep. and nine, and how these skills can lead to that. Because I know I wasn't thinking that way at that age. It wasn't until you got to college. So I, I think that that's really, really important. Yep. Just, uh, I also think that uh, one of the challenges that we have, and Jane Franklin, I don't know whether anyone's read her, she was just out here recently, the um, UNSW ADFA had her out. And she makes the point about the fact that girls are perfectionists when it comes to their education. And so if they aren't getting, particularly in the STEM area, if, yeah, it's challenging. And, and in a way, I, I can relate to this because the physics, the reason I didn't continue with physics was because I couldn't grip it up intellectually. Uh, and so and I, uh, by that stage, I was in yeah, year 11. What is year 11 now? It starts getting a bit pointy at that time. And you actually do have to start thinking about, OK, well, I need to get into university. I want the choice to get into university. I, I want a high score to get into the university I want. And so I'm not going to take any risks. And I'm not going to just ride with a 51% or 52% in physics, even though I really enjoy it and I've got a huge crush on the teacher. So I, I yeah, so I ended up doing a, um, a, a, a basically a humanita humanities degree, um, major or humanities subjects. The challenge that we have with girls, and this is the point that uh, Jane Franklin makes, is that the we, they're perfectionists and they don't, won't be happy with 51%. Uh, and and so they they're in a way they're not prepared to, to to yeah allow themselves give themselves that latitude if they're not getting the 90 or the 80 percent um, then game over I'm out of here. All right, we had another question I think over here, and then we've got one there. Or are we going the other way? No, we'll go over there first then. No, just yep, go ahead. Hello, you can hear me. Yes. yes. Um, I'm Basha Wesley. I'm from the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. It's more about uh, Professor Huntington's um, comment about, you know, educating the dads of the young girls. Um, I'm, I'm a molecular biologist. I've uh, done my research in four continents and the final stop being Australia. And after working for about four years, the funding ran out, so I took refuge in public service, like most people do in Canberra. <laughs> and um, um, yeah, so anyway, so uh, I live in Flory, and Flory is the only suburb in Canberra that is named after scientists. And my kids went to uh, the local mm. primary school. And um, so uh, I wanted to volunteer for the scientists and mathematicians in schools program but I couldn't go during the day, mm. so I could only go in the evening. So uh, I used to run information, or sort of actually parent sessions, where parents came along with their kids yes. after tea and uh, did experiments together with their children, just young kids, so that, oh, and then what we tried to tell them was that science is your everyday thing. I mean, at home, you know, yep. a lot of things you do is science and you can talk to your kids about it. Yep. And so basically letting them see that science is not some formidable, you know, subject, not for my kids, but it's your everyday thing. And I think they really enjoyed coming and playing around with <coughs> stuff in the school lab. 
Yeah, and and yes, and that that's a, the perfect solution. One of the, um, uh, the the more effective coding clubs are actually coding clubs that involve kids and their parents at the same time. Mm. Uh, the, the the top five influences of career choices of kids are parents, friends, random famous person, genuinely a random famous person. <laughs> <laughs> a trusted school teacher and careers advisor. And so what do universities and employers do? We go and talk to careers advisors all the time. Great, we had another question ready to go. Please go ahead. Um, I'm just interested in the panel's view on um, the, the topic here, preparing today for jobs of tomorrow. Um, we've taken a, a bit of a gender bent, which is, which is fine. I'm, I'm a father of two, two young daughters. I'm very happy to, to hear what your ideas would be around how we can better prepare young women, given we started with comments around creativity and that a lot of the so-called soft skills are where women uh, tend to far exceed men. Um, how do you see that that can maybe help in redressing some of the balance in the future? Some of the, so the softer skills? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it's funny, I, I actually, um, I'm a mother of two boys, and so I tend to emphasize the softer skills, for sure, because they, you know, they have to do a, the, the public speaking, the resourcefulness, all the things that did come out in this World Economic Forum study about creativity is you know, being resourceful, interpersonal relations, expressing yourself. Um, those things are really important. I think we all heard um, Gavin Slater say earlier how he impresses that on his kids, that um, just interacting with people. So I think that that's important, but it's certainly not part of a curriculum, right? So how do you, how do you have the schools, how do you incentivize the teachers to bring those soft skills into a classroom. That may be very personal. You know, one teacher may differ from, from another in terms of how they bring those into the classroom. But there's no real incentive to, to talk about what that means for the future of the workforce and the future of children. So um, again, I think that, that we're, we're having some public-private partnerships, some best practices, maybe there are places where soft skills are worked into the curriculum around the world. It would be good to know about those because I think that's very important. You can be the smartest physicist in the world, the most sexy physicist teacher in the world, <laughs> but if you can't you know, communicate what you have found, either as a teacher, and, and again, yeah. a personal experience I have is that my, I'm sure my teacher my algebra teachers and my my um, my calculus teachers were were brilliant people, but the ability for them to impress upon me why I should be learning these things and you know lack of enthusiasm. I mean it, that that's when I dropped out, and it might, and it's because I just couldn't see where this why, why this was important because the communication was so poor. So yeah, I'm very passionate about this. I think it's very very important, and as long as this creative problem solving keeps ticking up the list as one of the most important skills of the future, I think it will get more attention. So that's great, thanks for that question. I know I've got more questions, so let's roll in immediately. Go ahead, please. Yep, just, you're good. Hi, yeah, okay. Eleanor, you've kind of, ta kind of given me a really lovely segue. We run, I'm Fiona Anson from JobGetter, we run a national road trip every year called The Jobs Agenda, and it's a discussion between government, industry, and education around these sorts of education outcomes, employment outcomes, all of those sorts of things. And um, the, the one we ran in Canberra last year was really interesting because we had a number of school principals there. And we talk about this discussion has to happen between industry, education and government. And they quite rightly pointed out that we actually need to involve community and in particular parents. Yes. Because if parents are such big influences on what children decide to do. And it's one thing to involve a parent in a code camp, it's another thing to tell a parent what options that opens up in terms of careers for their children. Yes. Uh, yes. So I yes. think it's, I'd be happy to get your feedback on that. The other thing is career counsellors. We do a lot of work with career counsellors and I've had career counsellors say to me, oh, where do I get to this website? And I'll say, oh, you put this address in a URL, you know, this is the URL. And they go, what's a URL? So, you know, we've got to look at who's telling our kids what it is that their options are, not just, oh, there's STEM, but what are all the <coughs> options that are involved? So I'd, I'd be keen to kind of get your feedback on how we involve parents in this discussion and telling them what are the options and also career counsellors. I think we need to look at development of that industry as well. It'd be great if that could be some kind of a campaign, you know, some visuals that, that kids will glum onto because I agree that, that parents are very influential, but you can only sort of lecture your kids so much about what they can be when they grow up and why coding is important and math is important. But if there could be some sort of a way that you could, you know, bring these soft skills to the classroom, talk about career choices in sort of an age appropriate manner through visuals and campaigns and get kids engaged, I think that would be fantastic. All right. 
Hi, um, Harry with the Department of Human Services. Um, given the large portion of our customer frontline um, facing staff are female and over 40, um, in terms of upskilling this demographic, how would you nuance communication activities to empower them to, um, I guess, be encouraged to, to want to upskill themselves looking for you know, something else in their career? Well, they need to know that uh, the career is out there in terms of the, a, a, a potential an opportunity for them. And this is where vocational education comes in, uh, in terms of providing that pathway. Everyone's so focused on either second, primary, secondary, tertiary. And I, I am a huge advocate of, uh, of vocational education, particularly in cyber security, uh, in t particularly in adding to the existing skills of, of individuals. Uh, and so I think that they, first up, they need to know that there are opportunities for them. And in DHS, you have that massive centre. It's over the road from my uh, electorate office. And I've, I've had the tour. And so, yeah, if they're not getting an understanding of about the opportunities then, then take them on a tour. But I think that, uh, that, that A, that they know that there are opportunities for them in terms of careers and, and perhaps uh, the range of opportunities in terms of careers. Is. But secondly, the fact that there's that vocational education there, assert four, and this is where this national curriculum has come into its own. I think it's going to be terrific. Assert four or assert three uh, to get them through, and then some on-the-job training as well. Can I just add yeah, a couple in. of things to that? Um, the the first is that um, if you look at uh, the statistics in the ICT sector and for the ICT workforce. Um, only 50% of ICT workers work in an ICT company, if you see what I mean. So the other half of them are working in banks and government and retail and, and all of that sort of thing. Um, and so that that's actually one of the, the, the not the, the not well-known things about um, having this set of skills. And one of the things here is that there's a difference between the skills and the career, if you see what I mean. Um, and the other is that um, if we talk in terms of VET, so so I'm not one of those people who comes from a uni university who believes that universities solve everything, because yeah. we don't. Um, in terms of the VET sector, there are a couple of things that we do actually need to work on that nationally, one of which is that um, the way that uh, the national training packages are constructed, they're actually not sufficiently modular to be really agile, given the really fast, quickly changing environment that we're, we're working at. Um, and the VET sector in particular is struggling with micro certifications. They know that they need to do it, but they don't quite know how. Yeah, um, and agency. there are large monolithic blocks that make it very difficult. And if people want to accumulate micro qualifications to get to Cert 3 and Cert 4, it's actually very difficult, if not impossible. So that's, that's one of the issues. If you're looking at the STEM statistics in VET, it's even worse than higher education for, for gender. And, and, and just on the certification issue too, that's the challenge that uh, we're all facing at the moment in terms of who certifies. Uh, yeah, because there's a yeah there's a debate as to which organisation should be doing it, and and, yeah. and it's and it's being it's quite fractured at the moment because there's various peak associations and yeah. there's talk it should be a government responsibility. So but yeah, it's yeah. it's there's still a way to go on on vet, but at least we've got some courses rolling out. It's oh, still early yes. days. Yeah. It's still early indeed. days though. Yep. Okay, I think we're giving you the last word, Rob. Last question. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rob Fitzpatrick from AAA. <laughs> we have a rare opportunity in front of us right now, not just an all-female panel, hallelujah. I'm not um, doing interpretive dance, you can't make that. <laughs> <laughs> you are all leaders in your own field. I'd like to ask the question of each of you, Gay, Eleanor and Jennifer. Representing government, academia and industry, what would each of you ask the other two to help accelerate outcomes as you're uh, tackling this challenge in your domain? Good question. Excellent question. Uh, well, for Eleanor, it would be how to create that flexible environment for the hairdresser mm -hmm. to become the cyber security guru, uh, be it through a, a grad dip, be it through a Cert 4, uh, and all of this is accredited, of course, and certified, be it through a combination of both, because I do think that there's not enough marrying together of the vet and the, uh, the tertiary sector, and we need to be flexible on this. So it would be how we can allow the hairdresser to become the cyber security expert and uh, yeah, the, the yeah, create a flexible environment for learning. Uh, 
industry, there's a ton of things. Work with me to work out what you need. Creativity in the curriculum. Uh, it's what skills you need so we can map it, so we can start identifying, cutting and dicing and splicing that 19,000 so we can work out, okay, we need X, Y and Z. And, we, and that's from the vet, drawn from the vet sector, that's drawn from the tertiary sector, that's drawn just from secondary school, that's drawn from the hairdresser, a, a, a thousand hairdressers getting upskilled through a grad diploma in a cert form. So that uh, it, it would be working with the industry. And tell us what you really need uh, in terms of work readiness, uh, not just what, you know, I need four technicians with a, an X, Y and Z. Thanks. <clears throat> good question. It is a very good question. Um, well, so so I'm going to answer this from the question from the perspective of both higher education as well as vet. Um, we kind of sit in the middle of um, uh, parents, government, employers, uh, and. I would argue that what I'm interested in doing is I, I need help from every end to uh, map out this London Underground to work out where we need to put the railway stations, yep. and we need um, we need people to help put passengers on the trains to make sure that we've got the map right. Yep. Um, we and 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 that's what we need, and actually that's where I ended my my talk earlier in the afternoon. I'm, this is a call for help. We we we've started doing this. We've started making a few of these. We need a hell of a lot more. Um, and from the government side in particular, one of the things we need to do is move away from a regulatory re regime that is stuck in the 20th century to allow us to, to do this um, much more flexibly and have switching stations like the micro certifications and things like that. Um, we absolutely do not want to step away from having appropriate accreditation and certification and trusted providers and all of that yeah, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, but um, the, there are restrictions on, on the flexibility that the vet sector and the higher education sector can take at the moment, and that is um, dampening creativity, our creativity. I think for me it would be um, when we're talking about things in, in your, both of your respective uh, areas of focus, cybersecurity <coughs> and engineering, I think at first glance those generally come off as math and science, yep. you know, very intensive types of disciplines. So how can we use some of the discussions we've had today to sort of sh show the softer side of both of those at, yep. a, at a very early age? Um, teach the younger generation why cybersecurity is important without, you know, scaring them. Um, but also talking about what engineering can be as opposed to just, you know, uh, using maths on a, every day. What more is engineering other than math and science? I think that kind of conversation is very important for those that want to be an engineer but don't quite have the confidence to, to go down that path of math and science. I think well, that people would be who fantastic. don't realize they want to be an engineer. Exactly. Yet. They haven't figured it out yet. Indeed. Earlier conversations, I think, are really Indeed. important. Great. All right, I think on that note, we will have to wrap up now because I know that we do need to bring the day to a close. So I'd like you to please join me in thanking my panellists for this afternoon. Thanks, Brad. <laughs>